Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Zank, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's program on behalf of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies and the minor in Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies. Our serious topic this year is uh, the politics of genocide. The event this afternoon is the third in this academic year in this series, the Encounter series, and we have one more such encounter um, planned for this spring semester with Mark Garrity on April 14, who will speak on genocide ideology in Rwanda. You can find all the details on our website at bu.edu slash Jewish studies. At this point, I would like to turn over the introductions for today um, to my colleague, Dr. Sultan Dugan, who is a postdoctoral associate at the Elie Wiesel Center and co-coordinator of the Encounters uh, series with Professor Nancy Harowitz. Uh, Sultan's research is concerned with the with questions of citizenship and religious minorities in Germany after the Holocaust. Uh, she writes and teaches on the topic of memory, migration, mem memorials, and human rights um, after mass violence. I am now happy to turn uh, this event over to you, Sultan. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Really honored to welcome our speaker for today's Encounters event. Dr. David Tollerton is senior lecturer in Jewish studies and contemporary religion at the University of Exeter. Dr. Tollerton's scholarship deals with the question of Jewish and biblical traditions as they travel within modern politics and specifically within post-Holocaust thought. In 2019, he was awarded a Leverholm Research Fellowship for his work on religious responses to the Holocaust. His latest book, and I quote the title, Holocaust Memory and the Religious Secular Landscapes of Contemporary Britain was published by Routledge in 2020. In this book, he attends to the varied meanings of public Holocaust memory for Jewish, Muslim, Christian, and post-Christian communities. In its second half of the book, the focus turns to the ways in which state-supported Holocaust remembrance activities are intertwined with perceptions of sacrality. It is the first study to examine, uh, to examine Holocaust remembrance and British religiosity slash secularity in relation to one another and connected Holocaust studies with religious studies more directly. Dr. Tolleton's talk today titled Holocaust Memory and Brit Britain's Religious Secular Landscape is based on this work. This talk will be followed by Professor Abigail Gilman's response. She's also our moderator today. Abigail Gilman is professor of Hebrew, German, and comparative literature in the Department of World Languages and Literatures at Boston University. She's a core faculty member of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies and served as interim direct director of the center in 2016 and 17. Her last book, and I quote the title, a History of German-Jewish Bible Translation was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2018. Pertinent today to today's conversation is her 2004 essay on Holocaust memory in Vienna titled Cultural Awakening and Historical Forgetting, the Architecture of Memory in the Jewish Museum of Vienna and in Rachel Whitred's Nameless Library. I thank both of our guests and I open the floor to Dr. David Tollerton for his talk. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for the introductions. It's uh, lovely to be able to speak. Uh, for me this evening, I'm in the UK, so it's uh, it's eight o'clock p.m. here. So, um, Holocaust memory in Britain's religious secular landscape. Okay, so on 27th of January uh, 2014, former Prime Minister David Cameron held a reception in 10 Downing Street and the reception was for the launch of a new Prime Minister's Holocaust Commission. And in the short address, he said the following. He said, the sacred task is to think, how are we going to remember, to commemorate and to educate future generations of children? In 50 years time in 2064, when a young British Christian child or a young British Muslim child or a young British Jewish child wants to learn about the Holocaust, and we as a country want them to learn about the Holocaust, where are they going to go? Who are they going to listen to? What images will they see? 
Now, I'm interested in that quotation almost as a sort of point of departure because of um, the way in which uh, Cameron references these different Abrahamic communities. Um, and there's an implication uh, partly in this quotation, but um, more broadly in the rest of his speech of Holocaust memory is something that um, spans all of these communities, but in, in some ways in an almost slightly undifferentiated way. In this paper, um, and as mentioned in the introductions, it's um, based on a book that came out with Rapledge last year. Um, in this paper, I want to give a few short snapshots of the way in which it's a little more complicated, I'd suggest. Um, that the intersections of Holocaust memory and different British communities is more varied, more specific to context, and sometimes more ideologically awkward than um, the kind of grander political rhetoric can sometimes suggest. And one of the ways that I'll do this is I'll think particularly about um, a project which was the main outcome of this Prime Minister's Holocaust Commission. And this outcome was the plan for a major new Holocaust Memorial and Learning Center that would stand um, in Victoria Tower Gardens, right next to the Houses of Parliament in central London. Um, so on January uh, 27th, 2016, so two years later, it was publicly announced by the government that this new Holocaust Memorial would stand beside Parliament as a permanent statement of our British values. Now, to be clear, um, it's not been built yet. It's um, still running through some very complicated pr uh, planning processes. It should appear, though, I'm pretty confident it will appear sometime in the mid 2020s. But even though it's not there yet, um, some of the thinking and the planning behind it is, um, you know, very interesting to me and some of the kind of the way in which it's been framed just to kind of give you a sense of how they're envisaging this new site. So um, here's an image of the entrance way. Uh, so it's these 23 kind of large metal fins that uh, visitors will walk down through into this um, underground uh, memorial and learning center. And so they'll go downwards uh, from the kind of the, the light of the overground into this kind of much darker underground space. Um, and the, Underneath there'll be uh, exhibition space, um, so um, museums and talks and other events will take place in, underneath this park next to Houses of Parliament. And at the end of the journey is uh, a planned contemplation court. Um, and you can see this very kind of blank space, and though I should mention the words that appear just on the right of the entrance way, um, it's very pertinent to uh, speaking this evening. Um, so it's a quotation from Elie Wiesel, um, to forget the dead would be akin to forgetting them a second time. So a famous quotation from the, uh, the preface of Night. Um, and the idea is then that the visitors will go up into the light. They'll also, they'll be able to see central London, see the houses of parliament. So, this um, project is um, a major part of Cameron's ambition to make uh, Holocaust remembrance uh, permanent in Britain, to pass it down through generations in the way that he was speaking um, in that address uh, in 2014. Um, and this new memorial, this learning centre will be in a sense how the Holocaust memory would be passed down to the, the young British uh, Christian child, the young British Muslim child, the young British Jewish child that he kind of refers to in this speech. But I'm interested in the ways in which um, relationships with Holocaust memory and British Abrahamic communities can be a little bit more bumpy and a little bit more ideologically tangled up um, than is sometimes implied in some of the kind of more sweeping uh, discussions. So what I'll do is I'll straightforwardly kind of run through a, a few stories related to each community um, and then see where we want to go in terms of the discussions at the end. So I'll start with um, Jewish communities, British Jewish communities. Now there have been um, some elements of very vocal support 
for this plan for the new memorial and learning center this which was a, an idea that very much originally came from david cameron himself um perhaps most vocal has been the british chief rabbi uh ephraim mervis so ephraim mervis um in this government press release gave them a quotation in which he said i quote um, the establishment of a permanent memorial to the Holocaust next to Parliament at the very heart of British democracy will be warmly received by the Jewish community. Indeed, it sends the strongest possible message on behalf of the whole country that the lessons of the Holocaust will forever form a part of our national consciousness. Um, there have been other um, very vocal voices of support from the Board of Deputies for British Jews, from a number of prominent uh, Holocaust survivors as well. But Anglo-Jewish um, communities are varied and perhaps unsurprisingly, um, there have also been varied responses to this project, this project that's very much kind of come down from the state. Um, in October, 2018, eight Jewish members of the House of Lords wrote a letter to the Times newspaper in which they declared their opposition to the plan. They complained that it, um, in their view, would provide little additional public awareness of wider Jewish history, as in history beyond the Holocaust, that it would fail to counter anti-Semitism in Britain, um, particularly those surrounding speech about the State of Israel, and the, the considerable government funds that are going into this, it's about 75 million pounds, in their view could have been spent to um, more profitably for educational initiatives around the country. Now one of the signatories um, of that letter to the Times newspaper, which is a very major national newspaper, was uh, Baroness Ruth, Ruth Deitch, and Deitch has been particularly vocal in her opposition to this plan. Um, speaking on the BBC in November 2018, she said that, I don't know that the grassroots Jewish community has been consulted about this. The people I talk to say very quietly because they're rather scared to speak out on like me. They all say, I don't like this. It's not the right thing. To give you another example, um, Jeffrey Alderman. Uh, so Jeffrey Alderman is a, uh, a Jewish historian of, um, of Jewish communities in Britain and also uh, writes in media uh, regularly. He's very outspoken in various ways. Um, and in the Spectator, so it's quite a large uh, circulation publication in 2019, he said that within the wider set of Anglo-Jewish communities, I failed to detect any great enthusiasm for the gigantic memorial that they are proposing. What I've detected is incredulity, embarrassment, and cynicism. Now, whether Deitch and Alderman are completely right about this when they sort of speak on behalf of um, other parts of uh, British Jewish communities, I'm not completely sure. But the point um, I think is that you shouldn't simply assume unequivocal um, Anglo-Jewish support for a government initiative for Holocaust remembrance. Um, since the 1990s, Holocaust remembrance in Britain has generally been very state driven, at least in terms of some of its kind of organization and Jewish community reactions to it um, going back several decades have varied. In the early 1990s, um, there, the government set up a new national educational curriculum uh, for the first time, and there were considerable debates about whether to include the Holocaust within it. Um, in an article in the Jewish Chronicle newspaper, um, the uh, Jewish academic historian uh, Lionel Cohen took to the newspaper to argue against the inclusion of Holocaust um, within the British education system. He argued that teaching non-Jewish children about the Holocaust um, would mean that they didn't learn about any other aspects of history and that it would create an unrepresentative and kind of grim negative view of uh, Jewish identity. You get a sense of this a little bit in the title, Life Over Death. He wanted to focus more teaching on um, 
that people would learn about Jewish history more broadly than learn about specifically the history of the Holocaust. Another example um, comes from the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, so at the turn of the century, the Labour government, which was led by Prime Minister Tony Blair, set up a new National Holocaust Memorial Day. And again, this was a very much a, a, a state initiative. Um, it was an idea that um, came from the Labour government at the time. Um, and it's grown hugely since it started in 2001. Um, just to give you a little, a nice graph that gives you a nice breakdown of this. Uh, this is a slide which shows you the number of local Holocaust Memorial Day events in Britain recorded since uh, 2006 through to 2020. Um, since 2006, it's been run uh, by the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust using government funding. And you can see that there's been this enormous growth in the number of Holocaust Memorial Day events. It's become a much more fixed element of British public life. But when it was set up, um, it did have varied responses from um, British Jewish communities. Some were hugely supportive. Um, the chief rabbi at the time, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, was very vocal in his support for the establishment of a new Holocaust Memorial Day. But it did provoke varied reactions. Um, this is uh, a picture of a, um, an article, again, in the Jewish Chronicle, written by the Home Secretary at the time, uh, Jack Straw. And so he's writing to uh, the Jewish readers of the Jewish Chronicle, arguing why we need a Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I think the very existence of this article is quite interesting, quite revealing in the sense of, you know, you've got a, a non-Jewish government minister writing to uh, a Jewish audience, sort of trying to lay out why this needs to happen. And as I say, reactions were varied at the time. Um, to give you a, a little selection of the kind of the the, uh, the negative reactions, um, Norman Lebrecht, uh, as a cultural commentator who wrote regularly in Jewish Chronicle, um, responded to Jack Straw saying, you can include me out of Holocaust Memorial Day. For Lebrecht, um, he felt that Holocaust Memorial Day would be superficial. He thought that it would be an act of political virtue signaling. Um, there were others as well who voiced unease. Um, in the independent newspaper, Nick Cohen, who's uh, criticized the plan as in his words, uh, voyeuristic hypocrisy. Um, he picked up particularly on um, government policies regarding refugees at the time and suggested that this kind of creation of a new day was a kind of hypocrisy at the time. Um, and one last example, uh, this is uh, Yitzhak Shochet, who is uh, an Orthodox rabbi at um, the Mill Hill United Synagogue in London, um, arguing that a Holocaust remembrance would distract from more traditional Jewish identity and observance. Now, obviously, those are just a few voices, some of them writing in Jewish Chronicles, some of them writing in wider um, national newspapers. And as I, as I should say, um, there are also considerable voices of Jewish support for um, Holocaust Memorial Day when it was set up. But my point is simply that um, when Cameron in 2014 spoke of uh, how the young British, Jew uh, young British Jewish child should remember the Holocaust, we shouldn't imagine that, um, that that's a single fixed thing. Um, Jewish reactions to these government-led initiatives have been uneven, have been contested. Jewish communities are diverse. Jewish reactions to state-led Holocaust remembrance have been diverse. Now, what about um, the young Muslim child of Cameron's speech? What about uh, Britain's Muslim communities? Well, at times, and in some quite high profile ways, this has sometimes been a quite difficult relationship. Um, so from 
2001 to 2007, and then again in 2009, the Muslim Council of Britain uh, boycotted Holocaust Memorial Day. So this thing, this event that had been set up in 2001 and which now has become um, an extremely uh, you know, well-established, well-observed uh, event in British public life. So the Muslim Council of Britain um, boycotted it and they framed the boycott to some extent as an argument about um, not wishing to focus on overly on the Holocaust and wishing to focus on genocide more broadly. But in reality, everyone knew, and it was pretty straightforwardly obvious, that um, this was an argument about uh, Middle Eastern politics that had worked its way into this British context. Um, in a sense, they were expressing grievances regarding the situation, as they saw it, situation of Palestinians. And you can see this um, in the press releases that the Muslim Council of Britain produced at the time. Uh, so uh, Yusuf Bialok, who is General Secretary 2002, said, genocide is the most abhorrent and outrageous crime against humanity. We are not going to prevent it by selectively remembering only some of its victims. Um, Iqbal Sakrani, a year later, made a, argued in similar terms. The living memorial for the victims of the Nazi Holocaust is ensuring that we make the cry never again real for all people who suffer everywhere. So there's this language of saying, you know, we want, uh, we don't want to focus specifically on the Holocaust. We want to focus on genocide in general. But the press release titles makes it quite obvious what's really going on. Um, so Holocaust Memorial Ceremony, MCB regrets exclusion of Palestinian tragedy. Um, this is really what they are focusing on. And the fact that um, the boycott ran 2001 to 2007, stopped and then came back in 2009 is related to the fact that there was a upsurge in, um, in uh, conflict in Gaza in 2009. And so they brought back their boycott of Holocaust Memorial Day. Now, there's a few things to note with this. Um, aside from the pretty obvious point that um, making implicit or explicit comparisons between the Holocaust and uh, Israel-Palestine conflict is um, spectacularly controversial and problematic. Um, but beyond that, there's a few interesting notes in this. Um, first, there's actually something slightly ironic in the Muslim Council of Britain's position at the time, in that um, Holocaust Memorial Day could hardly be described as having you know, a strong Zionist undercurrent. Um, frankly, it, Holocaust Memorial Day in Britain rarely ever mentions Israel. Um, if you listen to the National Holocaust Memorial Day events, which are frequently televised, they will virtually never ever mention Israel. Um, the material produced by the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust will never mention Israel. It's um, kind of politely worked around in state Holocaust remembrance in Britain. Um, so a second thing to mention with this is that the Muslim Council of Britain should not be conflated with Muslims in Britain in general. Um, there are significant debates about how representative the Muslim Council of Britain really are. Um, and the government relationship with the Muslim Council of Britain was going through considerable flux at the time. Um, it was the favoured representative body by the British government in the late 1990s, early 2000s. But quickly in the 2000s, this relationship went downhill. It went downhill partly through um, British support for the invasion of Iraq in 2003, but also because of this boycott. And in reality, the uh, relationship between government and the Muslim Council of Britain has never recovered since. Um, and the Muslim Council of Britain, it should be mentioned, realized that their boycott was unsustainable um, politically and in terms of public relations it was just disastrous 
And it created this perception in Britain that Holocaust memory was a problem for British Muslims. Now, that's something um, that in various ways uh, some people have tried to change. And a, a high profile example of this is uh, the London mayor, Sadiq Khan. Uh, Sadiq Khan is a uh, uh, practicing Muslim and one of his first public uh, activities upon being elected London mayor, I think his first public activity in fact, was to speak at Yom HaShoah, the Yom HaShoah ceremony in central London. Um, and there have been many other members of uh, Britain's Muslim communities who have been actively supportive of Holocaust remembrance and indeed quite critical of uh, what the Muslim Council of Britain did in, during the 2000s. But to talk a little bit more about Holocaust memory and Muslim communities in Britain, I want to go back to this uh, 2016 announcement of the new Memorial and Learning Centre that's going to be built next to the Houses of Parliament. Note the reference to British values. Now, for a US audience, the term British values isn't necessarily going to kind of ring too many bells. It's going to, I, I'm guessing it sounds relatively generic um, and relatively vague. Um, and on one level, that is how it works. But British values is a term that's actually become increasingly had specific meanings and has grown in public discourse in the UK hugely in the last 10 years. Now, British values, when defined by um, the government, are very broad. Um, they're defined as, oh, I should get this right, um, democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, mutual respect and tolerance. So all good, unobjectionable um, values, essentially. Um, but the important thing is where the term comes from, where this term British values comes from, and is part of where some of the controversy lies with it. Um, it comes specifically out of anti-terror legislation in the 2010s. Um, so firstly, in the PREVENT strategy 2011, which is for the prevention of terrorism, uh, also the Counterterrorism and Security Act of 2015. And these are um, the bits of legislation that defined this term British values, used it in a kind of a legislative way for the first time, and used it as a way of defining the opposite of terrorism, the opposite of extremism. So extremists are those who oppose British values. British values is that which is opposite to extremism. Um, and so the term British values became heavily associated with combating Islamic extremism in the UK, um, particularly, in, um, I mean, in the long aftermath of uh, attacks, London bombing attacks in 2005, but also in further um, terrorist um, events that happened on through the 2010s. And this language of British values worked its way out from anti-terror legislation into education policy very quickly, actually. So um, British schools uh, and colleges, um, and to some extent also universities, um, have to prove that they are promoting British values. I mean, I've had to complete British values training as a university lecturer. Um, I have to have training into detecting how my students might be veering away from British values and what I should do if they are. Um, and it's also come into language of Holocaust remembrance in various ways. Um, so it was in the announcement for the new Holocaust Memorial and Learning Center, as I mentioned, it's in various political speeches. Um, and it's moved into language surrounding Holocaust Memorial Day. So I would just point you to a very recent publication on this. Um, so literally, um, a just a couple of months ago, uh, a new book, The Palgrave Handbook of Britain and the Holocaust was published. And there's a really interesting chapter in it by Cara Critchell entitled, From Celebrating Diversity to British Values, The Changing Face of Holocaust Memorial Day in Britain. 
And what um, Cara Critchell is interested in is how this language of British values has worked its way into um, events around uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. And it should be said, um, a lot of Holocaust Memorial Day events happen in schools, and a lot of um, those events are used as evidence of schools having um, met the criteria for promoting British values. Um, so when these schools have to show tangible evidence of um, British values, they can't you know, point to teaching chemistry or math or something like that. They have to have to do something in a different way. And um, Holocaust memory frequently gets framed in this, uh, in this story. Now, um, it should also be said though that, um, that British values is a very controversial term. And it's controversial because of the extent to which it's been sometimes associated with Islamophobia. Um, so uh, Comrades, who are a major polling company in the UK, in July 2019 produced um, major headlines around the country with a um, survey of 2,077 people in which um, they asked people about British values. Importantly, they didn't define them. They just used the term British values and found that 48% of their respondents um, saw British values as incompatible with Islam. Um, and it should be said, Britain does have a significant problem with Islamophobia. Um, so uh, this is data from the British Social Attitudes um, Survey from 2019. Um, British Social, Social Attitudes is um, a, uh, a, a survey that's been kind of running for, for years and years and years. All their data is up online. It's, um, it's a little bit like um, Pew in the US to some extent, and there's huge amounts of data. The last um, big treatment of religion that they looked at was 2019. And here they're looking at um, attitudes towards different religious groups. The important thing is on uh, the right hand side of this graph, the yellow. So this is the, um, the, those, the extent of negative views towards different religious groups. And noticeably, um, the yellow is larger for Muslims. I mean, still the overwhelming majority are either positive or neutral regarding Muslims, but the negative is still a larger chunk. Um, and just one other graph to throw at you. Um, this is the latest uh, data on uh, religious hate crimes recorded by the UK police from, uh, that was in the year uh, March 2019 to March 2020. And a quick look down the numbers will show you that 50% um, of uh, hate crimes recorded in Britain, religious hate crimes, 50% uh, are against uh, Muslims. I mean, you should also look at that number for um, hate crimes against uh, Jewish people. It's 19%, it's much higher than um, uh, the Jewish population as a proportion of Britain. Um, but just for my what I'm saying right at the moment, notice that 50% for um, Muslims. Now, how does this all tie up together? Well, um, what I want to suggest is that we should be uh, wary of Holocaust remembrance becoming wrapped up in ideas of Britishness that can be perceived as exclusionary, in this case, exclusionary toward Muslims. Now, what about the last group uh, Cameron mentioned, the young British Christian child? So, um, on one level, uh, in Britain, as in many other countries, we've seen major strides forward in terms of Christian reflection on Jewish-Christian relations. Um, in 2019, the Church of England, um, which is uh, 
Britain's largest Christian denomination. It's also the denomination um, attached to the state. So the Queen is the head of the Church of England. She's also the head of the state. Um, the Church of England published a document, um, God's Unfailing Word, Theological and Practical Perspectives on Christian Jewish Relations. And it is very direct in its language of self-criticism. I'll just read you the, the key passage. They say, the theological teachings of the church have in fact compounded the spread of the virus of anti-Semitism. The attribution of collective guilt to the Jewish people for the death of Christ um, has been produced a subsequent, and the subsequent interpretation of this um, as collective punishment by God is one very clear example of that. Within living memory, such ideas cont contributed to fostering the passive acquiescence, if not positive support of many Christians in actions that led to the Holocaust. Recognition on the part of the church that it bears considerable uh, responsibility for the spread of antisemitism demands a response from the church. Um, so it's quite seriously self-reflective, quite self-critical stuff coming out of Britain's um, largest Christian denomination. But there's a serious snag in this that I, that I just want to consider, which is how that kind of self-reflection is actually being communicated. Um, because the overwhelming majority of people who self-define as Christian in Britain don't go to church and certainly don't read Church of England documents. Um, and in fact, a very nice example of this is uh, David Cameron himself. So in an article for the Church Times newspaper in uh, April 2014, David Cameron said, I'm a member of the Church of England and I suspect a rather classic one, not that regular in attendance and a bit vague on some of the more difficult bits of the faith. But then he also said, but we should be confident about our status as a Christian country. Now, how does he combine those two things? Um, well, for Cameron, um, Christianity is about national identity. It's about Britishness, or more accurately, Englishness in this case. Um, and he's hardly alone in that. The part of the reason why he speaks in such terms is probably because he believes it, but also because um, many uh, conservative vo voters think in such terms about Christian identity, British identity, um, and there's a kind of there's a demographic overlap in kind of these different things. And from Cameron, it's perhaps unsurprising then that language of British values then sometimes slides into Christian values. Um, so in December 2011, he said that the values that define our country, these are values we treasure, and yes, they are Christian values. And we should not be afraid to acknowledge that. Now, the reason why I pulled some of those threads together is I think once you start to think of British values as Christian values, it puts a peculiar spin on an announcement that a new Holocaust memorial will stand beside Parliament as permanent statement of our British values. Um, now, to be clear, I don't think that the new Memorial or Learning Centre is going to be overtly Christian in any meaningful way whatsoever. Um, I don't think it's going to have you know, obvious Christian messaging at all. But what's conspicuous, I think, in the planning for um, the memorial and state-led Holocaust remembrance more broadly is that they tend to not really engage with the more challenging bits of Jewish-Christian relations. Um, to quote from Cameron, they're a bit vague on the more difficult parts of the faith. Um, so National Holocaust Memorial Day ceremonies um, or the Holocaust Memorial Day debates that happen in Parliament pretty much never mention, for example, um, the fact that Jews were expelled from England from 1290 to the mid 1600s. Um, in religious studies teaching in schools, Holocaust memory is positioned as something you learn about in relation to Judaism, not something you learn about in relation to Christianity. 
And so I'd argue that there's a potentially difficult disconnect, that remembering the Holocaust speaks to national values, that national values are Christian values, but that outside of formal church structures, there's not that much public engagement with the more challenging bits of Jewish Christian relations. And then finally, there's one further complication with this. This is the fact that Christianity is in major decline in the UK. Um, so actually a few days ago was a national census in the UK, um, the first for 10 years. Um, and there's a question in the national census about religion and no one is expecting anything other than for affiliation with Christianity to go down. Um, the table that I put up here though is um, from British Social Attitudes Survey from uh, 2019. And from their data, um, the situation of Christianity, which is the kind of the pinky purple dot on here, has um, slipped below 50% and did so sometime in the mid 2000s. And at the same time, the number of people self-defining as non-religious, which is the kind of bluey green line, has gone into the majority. Um, and as this slide shows, the two are interconnected with one another, the Christian and the non-religious. As one declines, the other goes up. Um, and the non-religious are, in that sense, broadly speaking, kind of post-Christian. They might not literally have been Christians themselves, their parents may not have been Christians, but the demographic that's going down is kind of connected to the demographic that's going up. Um, and they're also predominantly young. Uh, the younger you are in Britain, the, it's far more likely that you will self-define as non-religious. Now, what does that have to do with Holocaust memory? Um, well, firstly, I think it's interesting in the sense that if you're young, you're also far more likely to be exposed to Holocaust remembrance activity. Um, so something that should perhaps be considered, I think, is whether learning about the Holocaust has become a new way of articulating ethics and values in Britain amidst a situation of Christian decline. Crudely speaking, if you want to speak to a group of 16 year olds in Britain about, um, you know, values, don't talk about Jesus, but you can talk about Holocaust remembrance. That does work, it does resonate, it's a, but it's positioned as a way of teaching about human rights. It connects, I think, into um, an idea uh, expressed by uh, Herbert Mushamp, the uh, American cultural commentator writing three decades ago, who wrote, I quote, that the Holocaust has filled a theological void for a secular culture unable to turn to religion for an authoritative standard of absolute good. History has um, provided us with as close as we are likely to come to a standard of absolute evil. In this sense, Holocaust remembrance fits into Britain's religious secular landscape as something that should be seen in a context of uh, Christian decline, despite this language of Britain being a Christian country that comes from some conservative politicians. So finally, going back to this speech, I suggest that we need, I, I would suggest, a more nuanced way of thinking about Holocaust memory and social diversity in Britain's religious secular landscape. Cameron talked about um, memory as a sacred duty in, that, in his speech, in that passage I read right at the beginning. But amidst that language of sacredness, um, we shouldn't ignore, I think, the messiness that um, is how memory interacts with tangible communities. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Should I bring my slides down? Not sh um. I'll, I'll leave it up for the moment, unless you say otherwise. 
Okay, well, um, I, um, I'm Abigail Gilman. I don't know if you can see me. Um, I, um, uh, I just wanted to remind um, everyone who's listening that you can post your um, post a question for Dr. Tollerton in the Q and A um, column, and um, after I make a few comments. I um, will be happy to read your questions aloud. Unfortunately, you won't be able to say them yourselves and we can have a give and take with, uh, with our speaker in that way. David, maybe you should take down the slide. Because okay. then I can, maybe we can both be viewed or I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is this is incredibly fascinating, and um, monuments are are uh, uh, the whole topic of creating a monument, creating a any kind of memorial ritual is to me endlessly fascinating and endlessly, um, you know, um, these controversies are are as you said so incredibly messy, and I think you are approaching them from many different angles. Um, so I, I just have a few responses and a couple of questions and um, I'll put it out there. Some of them are prompted by my having a chance to look at your book. Um, and I know that our, some of our speakers are, are some, some of the um, people here also have some questions. So I wanted to ask you about Ellie Wiesel. I think that would, that would be you know, one thing. Um, and I don't know anything about the reception of Elie Wiesel in Britain of night, if it has the kind of status in Britain that it does um, here in the US where it's, it's, it's so widely read um, in middle school and high school and um, has that um, incredible power in, uh, for young people. I think I saw a photo of Elie Wiesel in the memorial uh, uh, underground uh, um, that famous photo of him and his in the bunker in the in the uh, in the bunk, and um, and the quotation um, printed on the wall. So um, you do talk about his that Ellie was kind of Wiesel like Wieselian tropes and kind of Wieselian language as as though it were very influential, but. Um, in this whole conversation, but not always in a good way. So I, I, I do want to know. Um, about the general kind of general role of Elie Wiesel. Um, and uh, so you started off with this incredible uh, quote by David Cameron. And um, it's, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, the notion of this, of, a, of, you know, he uses the word sacred task, that this is a sacred task in the future. And of course he could have said, um, what, will, what will we tell any British child? Um, <laughs> you know, when, when uh, he or she asks, you know, in, in 50 years from now, um, or what would we tell any child who's in Britain who, who wants to learn about the public? What, what will we tell any child um, or any tourist or anyone who comes to our country? Um, what our, how, how British people um, remember and commemorate the Holocaust, but he didn't and he, he opened up maybe a Pandora's box by uh, Islamic, Christian, and Jewish uh, ch children. Although um, I can't help thinking about, since Passover is coming, about the, that kind of biblical tone question that comes up of what will you tell your children when they ask you down the road. So opening up, a, even there you have a opening up for a, lit a liturgical response, a kind of religious, the religion, the way religion enters in. Um, and um, the question of, you know, the, of British values, um, and it's 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 very com complicated and very problematic in, in a lot of the ways. One thing, though, that as well, which is something you wrote about, is the fact that um, British values also incorporates the, the British role in the war and the British role in World War II and perhaps kinder transport uh, and uh, liberating Bergen-Belsen. And so, you know, history, it seems like if I would advise the, <laughs> the British, I would say, you know, that a British, you know, a British values uh, understanding of the Holocaust to be communicated 
to be ed to educate and even to be perhaps in embodied in a memorial um, you know needs to reflect or somehow you know codifies or fixes or reflects an understanding of British history as well as you know Jewish history or the history of genocide or the history of murder um, or something like that and I <clears throat> I um, I was uh, thinking about one of my favorite Holocaust uh, uh, monuments, which is the one in, in Johannesburg, uh, South Africa, uh, by Herman Herman Wald, and uh, you know, with with, but it's you know, it's a monument, it's a memorial in a Jewish cemetery, so it doesn't have, it's not so fraught. Um, but you know, I think the quotation used there is simply "Do not murder." You know, from, it's biblical, of course, but "Do not murder." Okay, I think we can all agree on that. Uh, we can build consensus around that. So there has to be, you know, some consensus about our understanding of, of our own history for us to be able to create new rituals. Um, so a few more things. Um, I, I didn't, I thought that, you know, the idea that there is boycotting and that, that, that Holocaust Memorial Day is so controversial and even boycotted is, uh, is kind of shocking. Um, <laughs> Um, and I'm wondering, <clears throat> is, is the reaction against that, and is this what you're arguing, is, is, the, re is the, the reaction against Holocaust, Holocaust uh, um, Memory Day, Holocaust Memorial Day, um, is the reaction against that because of what you see as this kind of sacralization uh, uh, of um, Holocaust memory um, is the sense that it's that this is a now a kind of a new obligation, um, and you know, in a time when, as you said, that religious affiliation is more and more voluntary, um, that it makes it it becomes something kind of non-negotiable, universal, eternal, and even sacred. And <clears throat> do you think that the reaction against against it has to do, has something to do with that. Um, and then in turn, then, and then we, you know, then we talk about the, uh, the desire to, to construct a um, very, a very large monument in a very prominent location um, next to the parliament in London. And so are you saying that, does this, this seems like this follows chronologically after we have this, these, these Holocaust Memorial Day with you know local ceremonies and many ceremonies in schools and that that graph that showed you know that incredible um, so this is something that is widely observed and commemorated and then <clears throat> but still very controversial even boycotted is do you think the desire to build this monument has something to do with finding another kind of <clears throat> another is a monument going to solve the problem? In other words, is, was was the idea that the monument would become some would be better at creating consensus um, by creating some you know a kind of sim, a, sim, a symbolic place of remembrance? <clears throat> I think uh, if you uh, have time, I would love to hear your thoughts about that design and what you write about it in your book. Everyone should you know go go read your book, um, I would just say, but your, your discussion of that whole, the design, the process and the designs. And um, one thing you say that really, really caught my attention is that the, um, all the, you know, there was a large competition, 10 designs submitted and that all of those designs um, incorporated, you know, Jewish elements, different Jewish elements and motifs and verses and customs, and um, I um, that and then the idea that this you know this design that was chosen, which you showed at the beginning, which I think looks like these like giant bronze fins almost, and that you can kind of go in and out of them. Um, ha, is it that the uh, the designers, the architects Arad and Ajaye? suggest that that's an allusion to the covenant between the pieces between Abraham and God in Genesis. And I thought that was 
kind of um, just, um, I don't know. I don't know if that's, if that's, if that's actually true or if that's, if it is, then it's, it's almost a little bit of a comedy to think of that, you know, they're kind of drawing, you know, what, what kind of Jewish elements and motifs can I um, draw upon to create a monument? It's not a simple thing. And um, so I guess the, la the last, uh, my last observation, because I think, I think a lot about monuments and I'm still very much caught in um, James Young's kind of distinction between a, a monument and a counter monument. And, you know, it's I, to me, it's I very clearly either one or the other, but, but we are clearly now in an age of counter, counter monuments are the norm. And I don't know if you use that term or if it's still an operative term for you, or if maybe we're, maybe we're beyond that um, distinction. And um, <clears throat> it seems to me that in like in the age of the counter monument where our monuments are very abstract and um, unstable, that um, there is this, temp you know, this temptation to draw in religious motifs and verses and to, you know, that um, somehow it seems, some, seems to me that there's a deep need for religious symbols in um, grieving, in mourning, and in commemoration. And um, I, it seems, seems universal and somehow like, you know, I, I think that part of your argument is really interesting to me that you're able to that you're trying to kind of untangle, you know, what is what, what is all this rhetoric of sacred task and 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 rituals, new rituals, and um, and allusion to to religion, and what is what is religion doing here? Is it just rhetorical, or is it ideological, or is it controversial, or is it somehow ultimately just really you know you know in some ways a universal expression of a need for us for symbols. Um, a need for a kind of symbolic language to express, you know, these ultimate, you know, uh, these ultimate questions and these ultimate um, deal with, a, you know, so those are some of my reactions and um, thank you again. Cool, thank you. Um, should, well, I should just check. Should I should I respond or should we go to Q and A? Or sure. Why don't you I, I Why don't you that. respond and then okay. I will will. Or it, yeah. okay. Absolutely. I mean, I um I did I I I noted down the points, but I I'll I'll sort of pick some of them. I think probably. Right. Um. So, just on the status of uh, uh Ellie Vassell, I mean, I'm. Um, having never lived in the U.S., I. So I'm to some extent having to kind of slightly guess the comparison, but um, I'd say uh, Vizal is, um, reading of night is not quite so common in the UK, but Vizal is, um, you know, widely known and very widely quoted. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually something I suggest in the book that he's kind of, in the UK, he's kind of become a bit of a source of aphorisms. He's just, he, you just get Vizal quotations um, dropped in everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, without really a lot of the specifics of the kind of where he's coming from, why he's using this language of sacredness, um, mm -hmm. how it fits into kind of the, you know, Hasidic kind of language of mystery and revealing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you get a, a leaflet from the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, turn over page one, there'll be a picture of Vizal and a, and a, and a quotation, um, you know, on... Uh, you know, just in all, I can give all sorts of examples where um, examples from Vizal come in. And I mean, I, so for for Vizal, kind of language of sacredness around Holocaust memory was, you know, he talked about Holocaust memory as sacred frequently, in all sorts of examples. And um, whilst I don't think that, say, for example, David Cameron is a kind of a close reader of Elie Vizal, I, I think you get, he gets, he's, from Vassell being quoted a lot, you get this kind of permission to use this language of sacredness. He, I mean, David Cameron, you look across his speeches, used the word sacred about three times in other speeches across his entire leadership, and then used it, what was it, about three times, I think, in this particular speech. This And, you know, 
Theresa May gave, uh, announced that the building of this memorial when she was prime minister was a sacred national mission. So this language of sacredness is, you know, they're getting this vocabulary from somewhere. Um, and I think, you know, one strand of it, I think, is linked in also to the kind of, you know, why these kind of quotations from Vizal are kind of mm -hmm. used and dotted around all over the place. But I don't think this is based on any kind of, you know, close reading of, you know, Vizal's background of thought in any kind of major, major kind of deep way. Um, the point on um, on British history, uh, on engagement with British history, I mean, certainly there, there will be um, plans to engage with um, British history at the new Memorial Learning Centre. Um, but of course, there are, are inevitably, there are arguments about selectivity. Um, so, um, focus on British liberation of Bergen Belsen. Yes, absolutely, that will be focused on. Uh, kinder transport absolutely will be focused on. Um, there'll probably be engagement with sort of more complex questions about British refugee policy in the 30s, which are kind of controversial and difficult. Um, however, there are, you know, that I would point to say, um, the current president of the British Association for Holocaust Studies, Tom Lawson, is someone who would very much say that Britain needs to reflect on the links between colonial history mm -hmm. and Holocaust and how ideas of kind of territorial expansion and racial hierarchy transferred through kind of colonial thinking into Holocaust. And Britain is not up for that um, publicly. That, there's, that conversation is not happening with regard to Holocaust memory. And I think is, that's a shame. I think it's something that would be extremely valuable hard but extremely valuable um just i mean i can very quickly on the point about boycotting and sacralization um actually i i would i would say that the the muslim council of britain's boycott in the 2000s probably wasn't related to kind of perceived sacralization of the holocaust i i, I mean i think they actually at least at least not in, not in a straightforward way i think they they badly underestimated the extent to which Holocaust Memorial Day would take hold and would grow, mm -hmm. and then suddenly found themselves very isolated and very much on the wrong side of the argument. Um, there's a, they were chastised by a government minister in 2004, I think, in a speech, and they responded saying, you know, at what since when has being part of Holocaust Memorial Day been, um, you know, for everyone? And you kind of think, well, that's that's you. you I, you've miscalculated there. That's not the language you're meant to be using. Um, I, I mean, I think they they realised quite quickly mm -hmm. um, that they were on the wrong side of that. And certainly, Muslim Council of Britain today have got no. There's no plans to bring that back. That boycott. I think it was a bad miscalculation. Um, I suppose just the the last to to roll a few points together about. Um, the use of um, Jewish motifs and religious motifs. Um, I mean, I'd absolutely point to the work of Avril Alba. Um, it's published a book called um, Holocaust Memorial Museum, Sacred Secular Space, I think it's 2015. Um, and she's written a, a brilliant book about how, um, how Jewish symbols um, are kind of reused, reworked in memorial and museum spaces. And you, but then you can absolutely see it in this British example. Um, in the, something that I, I briefly mentioned in the books is how in the planning boards for the design, um, they, have a, they have a section which is just called, um, I think it's called concept sketches. And they just have, like this very eclectic mixture of all sorts of biblical references, religious objects, um, paintings of, of divine light coming down. Um, you know, it, it's remarkable. They were thinking in very, very religious, but very eclectic terms yes. through all of this. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and I think the reason for that, okay, partly is to do with it clearly in the context of Holocaust memory, it makes sense to use Jewish oh. symbols, but also it's about kind of empowering the experience of the site itself. 
I think. Um, so thank, I mean, I'll, I'll probably, I'll draw a line of it That's there. That's fine. No, well, thank well, you so some much. Of our, sure. Um, so some of our questions are, are, are related uh, to what you were just saying. Um, Alyssa Vallis um, says, thank you for this fascinating account. Um, do you feel that the migrant crisis of 2015 and after has fed into the debate about the Holocaust in the UK and the sense of ethical lessons that can or should be drawn from it? Um, there have been occasional accusations of hypocrisy, certainly. Um, so, to 2015 was um, the year that the Prime Minister's Holocaust Commission was a report was published in which they talked about building this new memorial. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was announced in 2016. And, and in amongst that, um, uh, Cameron was, David Cameron was very, very, very reluctant to take in mm. refugees, extremely reluctant. Um, there was a small U-turn at one point, um, but in comparison to, say, Germany, Britain has taken in extremely few refugees. And there are occasional accusations of hypocrisy in this regard, but um, not too publicly and not too often. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think personally, I think it is problematic. Um, mm -hmm. I would like those connections to have been drawn more overtly, but that's, mm -hmm. that's me. Mm -hmm. um, so um, um, I guess related is, um, I'm, I'm, um, is a question by um, Nena, uh, who says, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, to what extent do you think that the decision to embody the remembrance of the Holocaust in a grand monument is also a decision to give less importance to other atrocities of other historic or other historical events that perhaps deserve remembrance. Um, gosh, there's all sorts. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Um, this is something that has been controversial and caused um, debate. So I should explain this, the situation of how this monument's going to work. Um, so this monument, like, like Holocaust Memorial Day, does incorporate remembrance of other genocides, but only specifically post-Holocaust genocides. Um, so there will be engagement with um, remembrance of uh, genocide in Cambodia, um, Sudan, Bosnia, Rwanda, as there is in Holocaust Memorial Day, and, and so there will be within this site. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a, a there's a slightly, you know, tricky thing of how you, how this works, how the Holocaust becomes the kind of the umbrella over which to remember other genocides is, um, you know, an obviously kind of quite tricky thing to frame. But, um, in these, in the site and in Holocaust Memorial Day, they won't work backwards through time. Um, so there was some controversy in 2001 uh, regarding the fact that um, Holocaust Memorial Day would not recognize um, genocide in Armenia. Armenian genocide would not deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, also will not deal with any kind of accusations of genocide with regard to, uh, you know, British empire or colonialism in general. Um, so there is this suggestion occasionally that it's, for Britain, it's quite a convenient chronological way of organizing things because it means you don't have to deal with, um, uh, you know, uh, issues in Colonial colonialism. History. Yeah. And um, I mean, but I should say, I mean, a, a controversy that's been going on at the same time is with regard to memory of slavery. Um, so the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, is that um, there were plans to build a new slavery memorial in central London and um, it, it's just not gained funding from government and inevitably, inevitably the organizers have said, well, look at this other monument. Why is that getting funding? Why is ours? Um, 
that curiously enough, the uh, the new Holocaust Memorial Learning Centre is going to be built right next to a little, rather dainty, rather pretty Victorian memorial to the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, you could see it in those photographs. It's this sort of little neo-Gothic thing. Um, so you get monuments to the abolition of slavery, but not so much to the actual slavery itself. Um, and that has caused controversy in recent times. Absolutely. Um, OK, so uh, two more questions here. Um, um, was the um, so about the Holocaust Commission, um, was an international jury put together that chose the, uh, the Ghanaian British architect? Or was this solely a British uh, British committee? Um, it, I'm trying to remember now. It was, um, I think it was entirely British, the committee who decided on this. So the way they, there was a process whereby they, they had a short list of 10 designs. They mm -hmm. had um, various, and, and that, and they were sort of all publicly announced. Um, and they invited response from the public. But then there was, um, a small panel. Uh, I think it was 10 people. It featured quite a, quite a curious eclectic mixture actually of politicians. Um, the chief rabbi was on it. Um, but also some, you know, um, you know, uh, British television celebrities, uh, Jewish were on there as well. So, was, and, and there were complaints. I mean, um, Jeffrey Alderman, who's this uh, very acerbic uh, uh, Anglo-Jewish commentator, uh, was quite critical of that panel saying, you know, who put this panel together? Who, you know, how, how did they get to decide it? But it, yeah, it wasn't international. It was purely uh -huh. um, UK. Do you think it will get built? I think it will. I mean, I didn't get into the planning permission issues, which are fraught to say the least, um, because I, I do the short version of this. So um, the central government who planned this did not consult with the local government who are meant to give planning permission. Ultimately, the local government refused the planning permission. Um, and so there's currently a process where, whereby central government is overruling them. Um, but there has to be a public inquiry. Mm -hmm. And that's gone on late 2020. And the result of that will be 20, uh, April 2021. But I, I mean, I, I just can't see a government abandoning this. It's too mm -hmm. problematic a thing to do. Um, you know, regardless of, it, I mean, it almost certainly will be a conservative government for several years, but regardless of whether it's a conservative government or a Labour government in Labour in its current form, mm -hmm. they're going to push for this to be built. And I think it will, um, mm -hmm. mid 2020s. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain. Okay. Um, well, I'm um, I'm looking at the time, and I I I'm looking at my other um, our other interlocutors, um, uh, Sultan Dugan, uh, Nancy Harowitz, Michael Zank. I don't know if you have a, la a final question or if we have time. Sultan, did you want to say a few words? Um, I just wanted to thank David. I think this was a great talk and a great you know summary in a way, like a good overview of like what's going on. And I think there are kind of similarities actually to Germany, right? And I was wondering like, if you think about this in broader European terms, I don't know if you have, but you know, this idea of being Christian and being secular, that's a very European move. Uh, it's actually not so specific to Britain, right? So I was wondering, instead of thinking about this as like a secularization, um, why not think about this as a form of nationalism? Um, no, that's interesting. I mean, I, I think kind of both and. I mean, I, I, I briefly pull on those kind of those old ideas of civil religion um, from Bella. Um, in, in, at least in the book I do, uh, talking about um, Holocaust remembrance. And I'm hardly the only person to have done that. Um, so have kind of linked Holocaust remembrance with ideas of civil religion. We, and so that, I suppose, blurs the, the ideas of sac sacrality and also with nationalism together as well. I mean, you are, I, I agree you're absolutely right in terms of 
the dynamics in terms of um, secularization in Britain are much more similar to Western Europe than they are to the US, I think. Um, having said that, um, <laughs> one of the, the curiosities of Holocaust remembrance in Britain is clearly in the last five, six years, it's all become very British rather than European. Uh, it's all become language of British values. Um, the, um, when it was, Hol when Holocaust Memorial Day started, there was this idea of speaking of kind of European unity, which is because the government at the time was very favorable towards European unity. Whereas now the, the prime minister's Holocaust commission document doesn't mention European Union once um, because um, it's now become much more about kind of the, the British focus of remembrance. So that's a, that wasn't quite answering your question, but I kind of round about a couple of points. So I know that uh, Sultan has to leave, so I'm going to thank, thank Sultan first, and then I'm going to say uh, thank you, David, for this remarkable tour de force around the issues of Holocaust memorialization in the UK today. Your remarks were highly instructive and effectively and effective precisely because of your very carefully understated rhetoric. I really thought this was a wonderfully informative session and there's a lot to think about. Um, I want to thank Professor Gilman for her response and moderation and want to thank uh, our members of the audience who, who posted their uh, comments and questions and I apologize if we weren't able to answer all of them.